and going, Rah! you think, oh, dear. <laughs> Yeah, I was brought up in the old-fashioned way. I don't like making a dishonest living. But when, when my colleagues in the group who are here can't tell the difference between the one where nothing connects at all and the one where I think every note comes out, pees out of a pot. You know, one in five when you're lucky and you're happy and the instrument understands what you're trying to do and all this sort of thing. If they can't tell the difference at close range, and um, they're used to hearing me, what can the poor... Um, paying public on whom we rely, I think. So, um, we had to run it again the other day because we had some new people on board who didn't know the jokes. So, I just did just the... Um... Um, <laughs> I mean, the, uh, trilling is not a massive part of the curriculum, but there are just a few trills dotted about here and there, which I do think must be right, and I do think must not be too fast, and I do think should be clear and elegant. Meister singer, well, if you're on a C tuba, then it's a lip trill. If you're on a B flat tuba, um, th then you take it backstage and get another one. <laughs> if it's an F tuba, it's... But if it's an E flat tuba, no, that's a mess. It's a mess. You know, it sounds like a tuba trying to play a trill. Um, <laughs> I'm all for I'm all for lip trills if you You need to warm up a bit if you're going to do trills. Um, I should actually be giving a lecture on warming up. But um, th th does that answer anything? <coughs> yeah, good. Um, it's slow, and sometimes don't worry too much about um, whether you're trilling the tone specified or just a little bit more. You just doi, oi, 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 is what you hear. And you'd be very lucky to actually hear what the notes are, especially in a, in a big hall. That's another sub-paragraph, actually. You know, we occupy ourselves rightly with saying, um, <clears throat> oh, that's a marvellous new instrument, you know, well, it's uh, fantastic, you know, and uh, I can do this on it, you know, and uh, every time I play with a kid, well, you remember my old one, you know, I mean, if I, if I, if I, if I, if I, if I, this, this one, it's fantastic, you know. Like, um, <laughs> make a terrible fuss and we have a row of mouthpieces there. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know, <laughs> right to do it. There is later in the week um, a session on instrument design and you know, I, I love it. You know, I've enjoyed very much um, helping in the sort of further development of this instrument. It does fascinate me but it's a little bit it is a specialist hobby thing in a way because I've been able to prove over and over again Leopold Stokowski's statement which is quite simply that the hall people play in is at least as important as the instruments that the musicians play on and very often just so much more of a factor that quite honestly we're wasting our time talking about you know trills and dynamics and all that sort of thing because rooms you know this is quite a nice room to play in but my goodness I've played in some funny rooms you know, some of them feel marvellous and you come off all glowing with satisfaction to be told that you couldn't hear a single note <laughs> and, uh, there are other rooms with polystyrene rooms you know modern all purpose halls and let's face it there are more and more of those these days especially in Britain, we, do, um, we are suffering in this respect, where all the instrument design in the world and all the warming up in the world doesn't make a strap of difference. It sounds and feels desultory, and they shouldn't have concerts in rooms like that, but they do. And everybody comes out grumbling because it doesn't sound as good as the record. Um, it, it, it is a, a colossal factor, um, and you've always got the wrong instrument with you. You, know, you turn up somewhere with the right-handed one, and of course you should be going that way, and vice versa. You find yourself with the left-handed one and there's a curtain and a cross-looking stage manager receiving the whole brunt of it. <laughs> you take a forward bell, I've been experimenting with forward bells, and you can't see anybody else. You know. <laughs> You're still there blowing away and they've changed the piece or something. <laughs> so you can never quite be right. 
One of the great virtues of um, this particular model, the flat tuber, <coughs> is that you don't rest it on the chair, which is tiring. If you've got a bass trombone player here, you lift it rather higher above his ear than on the other one, which goes right into his ear, and you really have to get on terribly well to survive such a situation. It goes higher up, it goes in there, and you can shift the direction, because especially if you're playing in a brass quintet, it is essential to be able to either play straight down the centre gangway, if you're being a contrabass trumpet, or sort of move it right round here if you're underpinning the horn in an anonymous underpinning way as opposed to a positive way. Bell direction does make a colossal amount of difference. Unfortunately, you're never in a hall long enough to find out what difference it makes. Now, that's, that's very sad. Um, we are at a gross disadvantage on this instrument, however we design it. Think of those lucky trumpet players. You know, they, they, they are idiots, some of them. Not all of them, but some of them. Now, you, you've got a music stand, and they do the whole of their recital like this. Now, the marvellous thing about the trumpet is that it sounds totally different, you know, six inches from the music, two feet from the music, back from the music, back and over, forwards and over, and down the side, you get different timbres. Very skilled soloists, of course, um, know how to do that. That's if they don't play from memory. French horns can do it, and trombones in the symphony orchestra can do it too. You can vary the colours. With a tuba, you are a bit, a bit stuck. Um, because it's hitting that ball, and uh, you know, you're getting the whole lot second hand, but that's, uh, that's another matter altogether. Um, I was in the middle of saying something. <coughs> Have we got any more questions while I remember what I was about to say? Yeah. Uh, instrument I tried that horn, and I think it was great, but what happens when you're a little short, you can't reach the floor without how the you're a trick for that? It's a trick for that. <laughs> well, the best thing is for us to get together and meet, just have a look at you, because uh, you know, I, I don't have very long arms. And, uh, you know, I'm, I'm um, it's what you're used to, isn't it? You know, it goes along with driving on the left and flat warm beer. Um, <laughs> We grew up this way, and uh, I personally find it very much to my liking. I also like four in a row, as long as it's not here. I hate four in a row there. Um, I like four in a row there. It lies naturally. Vroom, missed. But, uh, you know, we are used to pistons in this formation. Other people are used to rotaries. Um, as long as a valve works well, you know, I don't really care too much whose patent it is, but I am used to pistons. And you know, I, I know all the foul languages understands when it sticks. Because they, that they understand English and French. <laughs> I've, I've run through most of my sort of topics, so uh, it's now yours. It's now all yours. You were talking about the F tuba earlier. Yeah. Do you use F tuba regularly, or are you relying mostly on the E flat? No, I don't use F tubers regularly because um, I was 43 last week. But um, um, that is very late to start on the F tuber. Um, but see, for all that time, I was unable to find a good one. Um, there are a lot of very good English F tubers, very, very good ones indeed. Um, if I can just do a spot on the F tuber, um, I've tried many, many German ones which have certain virtues which I think cannot be beaten, a lovely clarity. It goes down to the bottom of the bass cleft, and then suddenly for me, and I do emphasise for me, it stops dead. And some parts that one would play on an F tuber don't go below that, and so you would be home and dry. So therefore, do you spend $4,000 on an instrument which would do three pieces for you? Um, the answer is no, unfortunately, um, in Britain, because our method of funding is ramshackle to say the least. Um, we, our orchestras don't buy instruments for us. Every instrument I've bought I've paid for. I've never been given an instrument. I've paid for it because I'm free to say it's rotten. <laughs> and it keeps boozy. Um, but the F-tuber, it, it, it um, it, it's very close to the E-flat. It's close enough to be confusing. We grew up on the E-flat. Now, if you grow up on an instrument, um, there is a cut-off level where I'm prepared to say the time I would spend in learning to play the F-tuber, I'm better spent learning to play this one better. 
Um, having said that, there are just one or two spots dotted around where I do want an F-tuber, and I do actually have three. They're all good. And one of these days, and I'm going to turn up to the LSO, I need something to do Petrushka on. Um, I just have a, a, a strange little personal problem with Petrushka, um, which should be a warning to everybody. I just hate that A-flat. I play it on the C-tuber instead of the E-flat tuber. But things like Midsummer Night's Dream, well, you know, if I played this on the E flat and on the F, I wonder if you could tell the difference from, you know, uh, 50 metres. I don't think so. Um, but this is a little fruitier. It's a little bit heavier. It's not as sweet as the F, but it is heavier and it does dig its heels in very nicely. It records very well. It can get really almost as high as an F tuber with very, very nearly the same clarity. But what surprises people about this hooter um, is the the depth of sound it has as an additive. Now, this is another topic which I do think is important. And um, you know, people are sitting in that room, blowing this tube, blowing that tube, and um, having a time of their lives, which is terrific. And we're all saying, "What do you think of that? Oh, it's dark, darker than that. Oh, yes, well, I like that. Oh, that's got a very good A flat. All this business." They're judging the sound quality on its own, and of course, the real test of any tuba has got to be what it does and what it sounds like and the messes it will get you into or the problems it will solve at the bottom of a group as an additive, as an underpinning to other instruments. And that is the, <coughs> the first test of an instrument. Now, if you wanted to do other things, like sound sweet playing tunes and solos, well, that's fine, that, but that is a different thing to having an instrument which really has all the nutrient at the bottom of a group. The chances are that the instrument that has the proper nutrient at the bottom of a group is um, not very pretty on its own. I came to accept that fact years and years ago. I've got a lovely Rudolf Meinl. I would never play a solo on it. I mean, you'd all laugh. But um, it's partly my playing inadequacy, but be, for me, it's the additive quality that it has. The Alexander has this. Hirschbrunner, of course. Um, all the various people in there all have different qualities. But um, it is what they sound like in the group, and not what the bass trombone player thinks of it. Never ask a bass trombone player. <laughs> I've been very, very lucky all my life with bass trombone players, really. I'm the most fortunate man in the world. If I, you know, when I finish up at the pearly gate and I'm thanking God for what happened to me, it is actually the colleagues I've worked with for which I'll be most grateful. I mean, I've been in some scrapes. I sat next to a marvellous bass trombone player who doesn't waste words. For instance, several years ago, Chester was talking about breathing yesterday. Several years ago, I toured Southeast Asia. And there are a lot of insects in Southeast Asia. And so you take even half a breath, and the little wretch goes straight in. And before he drowns, he bites, and you get a terrible um, throat infection. It happened to all of us. And so, in self defence, an absolute phobia. I started going like this, breathing in, keeping the tongue right round the mouth just to stop the wretches going in. There was still plenty more to go, but I, I, I stopped the rest. <laughs> <laughs> I came home, and I thought it wasn't long before we did the Berlioz Fantastique. Um, and in London, we play that on the little and often breathing principle. And instead of... <laughs> when you play that at rehearsal, all the strings, all the rest of the brass, they all go <laughs> in unison. And of course, visiting conductors don't see the joke and they, they think they're being very cruel. <laughs> <laughs> However, there was one occasion when I was doing it louder than any of the piss takers, and that was quite serious. And we came to a concert, and um, Frank Matheson, my colleague, was on the concert said, shut up! <laughs> it was quite loud, and I thought, oh, well, I really must do something about it, otherwise you've got to be yelling, shut up, on all the conferences. <laughs> you, know, you, you need good colleagues, but don't ask them whether an instrument sounds good, because they're far too close to it. They're far too close to it. 
This much which sounds good here, but very often don't sound anything at all at a distance. And it is distance that we're looking for because concert halls are big. Even if for brass quintet concerts, <coughs> there's probably going to be in a room this size, maybe. Um, although, of course, you do find yourself in weird situations. But you are looking for the ability to project. We're also looking for clarity. Um, this takes me on to another topic, um, which Chester also mentioned yesterday. <coughs> about colouring the sound of the mouth. You see, we're all talking about instruments and mouthpieces as being the source of uh, this or that adjustment, and uh, it's you that's making the noise. You know, you're going down a brass tube. And whenever you're getting too serious or too anxious and, and a terrible mess and, you know, your life is collapsing around you, just remember that all you're doing is you're going down a tube and no one asked you to do it. <laughs> Just imagine the scene up there when St. Peter's ticking everybody off. And, uh, 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 yes, yes, I, 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 I solved the starvation problem in India. Yes, I got an airline going to New Zealand. Yes. And you go, what did you do? I played the tuba. Pardon? <laughs> 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 what does that involve? Well, you see, you've got this great big fix of brass thing. You say, oh, oh, all right, go on. <laughs> <laughs> but. You know, there are lots of different ways of going because you know you see it's your lip that makes the noise, that's the reed. But um, the sound you make is partly produced by that, it's partly produced by the cavity behind. And there is a natural tendency to have the biggest cavity behind, like Italian opera singers or something like that. Oh, so everything opens up, open throat and everything, and uh, finally you can hardly hear anything. If you want to be more audible, you've got to actually close everything up until uh, Somebody like me who's got a very, very average voice, you can close your mouth like that and it sounds, you know, it sounds like a lot of those um, people up in the north of England, where I come from, you see. <laughs> you can follow the sound you make very effectively. Slap in your face and open up. If you're looking for timbre within a note, then it's lovely to expand and make a rather more fruity and luscious sound. But supposing you're playing, not necessarily the flight of the bumblebee, but a, a, a brisk passage where clarity and punctuality are the order of the day. Um, let me see, uh, Alleluia Chorus. <laughs> close it right up, play very tight. That's not very pretty, but it will sound at the back of a church or a boomy hall, far clearer than... The more that one, that one's very nice for mediums. <laughs> and that one, that one is much better for quarter... Uh, Minims. We call them minims, damn it. Minims are half notes. <laughs> quavers are eighth notes. Semi quavers are sixteenth notes. Connoisseurs of the tuba obviously don't find that last one particularly pretty, but it's the one that works. You know, if you've got mystified customers wondering why there's this instrument in the background boom, 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 boom. Yeah, that, that is part of the part of the necessary skill be careful though because if you close your mouth normally the pitch goes up and if you open it normally the pitch goes down very good weapon that's how I do vibrato as a matter of fact <laughs> So be very careful that um, you line up the that with the pitch, with the right pitch and the right cavity. That's um, definitely a Fletcher sermon. Um, any questions? I mean, there's quite a few things I haven't talked about. Yeah. What kind of things uh, you feel are important in your practice routine? Practice routine. Um, I don't have a practice routine because. You know, I have to do 50,000 playing miles a year. Um, and so the English are not routine-minded. I think as a race we're not. 
Um, neither are we warm-up minded, because there are some days when you really don't need to warm up very much at all. There are other days when um, it just feels terrible, and the only way to get it going is to practice, just play sensible, basic things. Um, there are other days when you need to warm down. Uh, you know, I do know a very famous principal cornet player in England who has a warm down after a concert. He does all these high things all over the instrument. Terrific virtuoso, wonderful to listen to. He goes to the band room just for five minutes and does low notes after the concert that night. And he swears, I haven't dared try it because, you know, the pubs outside London close at 10.30. <laughs> <laughs> he, he's, uh, he swears that that solves, makes him feel far better the next morning. And he may well be right, I don't know. Um, it's worth trying. Um, yeah, yeah, look, it does depend what you did or didn't do yesterday and last week and what you've got to do today and tomorrow in four days' time. If we've got the ride of the Valkyries coming up. I mean, I haven't warmed up this morning. I mean, I've just been doing a kind of public trousers down warmer for all of you, which is actually, you're entitled to hear because this isn't a finished product session. It's about, you know, how we approach things. If the ride of the Valkyries is coming up, I find that very hard. And if I don't practice low notes, by God, I'm in trouble. And low notes are a nuisance. They take a lot of air and they're very tiring. And your neighbours wonder what the hell you're doing. And why you're doing that. So you can just imagine, can't you, somebody sort of going... Is young Arthur still doing his music? <laughs> tell you a lovely one for low notes. It's a beauty. Um, several years ago, I was told by a very cross brass bandsman in a pub after a concert that I wouldn't last, I wouldn't last two minutes in a brass band. Um, he was referring to um, something we've been talking about. So I thought, oh, yeah, I wouldn't last two minutes in a brass band. What do you do for two minutes in a brass band? And I went... I mean, if I did that for two minutes now, it's very entertaining. Um, you would hear it improving. You know, when you get up in the morning, uh, d d uh, personally, I don't have much grip on the bottom register. You know, the notes are there, but it's a strangulated fart noise. They're, 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 they're not... <laughs> <laughs> the instrument isn't resonating, and your lips feel terrible, and you want to just sort of go back to bed. But, um, for instance, that would be the kind of thing. But supposing it's the warm lips tuba concerto, see, that's a terrible nuisance because you've got to tighten the face up like nobody's business. And I personally, um, either I'm older or wiser, or <coughs> certainly the fact is that I can no longer, like I did as a teenager, just get up and play the warm lips tuba concerto um, because I've opened up the dynamic range and I've really got to do some hard blasting in the top. And I mean... concert doesn't come as a shock. Um, otherwise, supposing it's an average week, supposing you've had an average week, you've got no semi quavers to do and you've got no semi quavers next week and you haven't done any, it's as well to keep everything going on a united front if you can. But if you can does involve a lot of things. It depends on what time you get back at night. You don't want to disturb people. You can put a practice mute in. And the warming up business, of course, um, we do have a different attitude to that because most places where brass bands or brass ensembles or orchestras play in my experience, I have very, very limited space and accommodation backstage, and we have that one hour when the cellists want to have a bit of a rest. And so to have somebody going, um, you know, so, uh, occupying a whole booming corridor and the music for and going... <laughs> person feel better and more like playing, but it's a terrible nuisance to 90 other people, you see. And you've got to remember that. Terrible bloody nuisance. And it's the same in the brass bands. You should see the places the brass bands play. You know, they're, they're sort of standing in the street outside, warming up or sitting in a van or the car or something. And uh, it's very limited. You've got to be very honest about how, how up warm up is. You can very often use the first piece to warm up in. You know, very often the first piece you play on a program. And if you're doing recitals, Always pick a nice straightforward piece to start with, with some nice chunky quarter notes and half notes in it, just to get the chops warm. And also to overcome the little feelings of stage fright, which I do hope you get, because if you don't get stage fright, you know, you're not really a performer. It's essential. Um, you know, the best things I do are often when I'm shit scared, but that's another matter. Um, in the sort of 
humbug and the sort of pasteurised um, atmosphere of uh, practice, of course. You know, you, you can do all these things reasonably well. Um, no, gear practice intelligently to what you did yesterday and have got to do tomorrow. And I can't do any better than that. Don't practice endless high notes just because you've got the warm leaves to come up. If you practice up there, then the whole face tightens up and all these muscles suddenly will say, what are you doing? And you'll probably get a wobble. Don't forget we're face athletes and lung athletes. And if um, an athlete suddenly were to be doing 100-yard sprints, many per day, far more than he usually does, then his legs are going to go. And especially if you start first thing in the morning trying to do that sort of thing, um, you're going to do yourself an injury. So just remember that uh, we weren't actually designed by the almighty to go <laughs> down a tube. It's something we've brought on ourselves. <laughs> It's great, great fun and great amusement. The fun, I mean, I enjoy playing this thing more than ever. Part of the enjoyment, of course, is to do it better. Um, you know, occasionally I come off the platform thinking, oh, God, but, you know, I'm getting old in the tooth now, and there'll probably be several next week which will be all right. And there was one very good one in 1971 that I remember as well. <laughs> uh, you know, you sort of keep fueled up and you go on, and, uh, you know, some days it's not as good as others because we're human. And some days when too much practice can wreck it. I'm quite sure of that, but knowing which is the one to under-practice for and over-practice for is quite a skill. There are some people <coughs> blowing brass instruments at the age of 80 who used to have sorted that one out, but there are many days when the best ones I've done have been with no practice. Straight in, do it. But if <laughs> you can't rely on it because the next one will be a disaster. <laughs> <laughs> so, you mentioned the band competition at Albert Hall. Is yeah. that open to the public? And if so, how would you find out about it? Uh -huh. It's open to the public, but, but, but my goodness, those seats are so coveted. That you, I, I can't get into it. <laughs> the, the only time I have got into that was as um, a reviewer, reviewing it for a magazine and um, adjudicating. <laughs> you know, when you're actually in the box. They put you in a box. You're locked in a box for the whole day in the pitch black. There's, there's a, a grill for some air, and you're given your food and the whole night. <laughs> it takes five hours, and you listen to the same piece probably 20 times, and uh, they'll put a bucket in the corner. <laughs> it's hard. <coughs> When you practice with a mute, uh, isn't it different as far as the back pressure and the mouthpiece? And do you find it useful to practice with a mute? Uh, well, actually, yes. It, it is useful to practice with the, the mute because it feels marvellous when you take it out. <laughs> That's quite, quite, quite seriously. Um, if you blow hard against a mute, it's very useful for, you know, you arrive at a place, you've got um, 47 minutes before the show, and, you know, you're going to be taken straight there, no warm-up time. It's a motel, there's an airline pilot next door getting the vital sleep before doing Hawaii. Um, you, you mustn't make a noise. Um, I've got a euphonium mute that goes all the way into the bell, stops it down completely. I also use it as a normal mute, and it's very good for practicing. Just, just really opening up. You've got to practice loudly. People often don't practice loudly, you know. They're in a small room and they, they play at comfortable dynamics which feel loud in a practice room. You know, there are times when you've really got to give it some welly at home. Otherwise, you forget what the sensation is. You get back on there for real and the din around you is forcing you to blow loudly and you tense up. And when you tense up, everything starts going wrong. The breathing, first of all. So do practice playing loudly. It's totally important. Really give it one for one minute or however. Don't, 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 don't hurt yourself. <coughs> Just remember what it's like and remember that that's your duty. For <coughs> certain moments in concert. Wow! How are we doing? Anything I haven't said yet? <laughs> High notes. High notes are a joke. Um, I remember. Um, you know, people are often astonished at how high a tuba can go. Well, of course it can. I mean, all you've got to do is tighten your mouth up, and you know, the sky's the limit. Um, it's a terrible shame that a lot of people don't attempt Ole Schmidt's tuba concerto because they say there is a super double top F in the last movement. Well, that's not the least important thing about it, you know, as long as you can go whoop and uh, make some kind of gesture. It's a bit of circus. But they are fun to do once in a concert. It's like doing a quick drag act. You put on somebody else's clothes and everybody hoots with laughter and then finish. Don't do it with composers listening. <laughs> For the, for the simple reason that they suddenly put it into some serious context and it then becomes a, a daunting problem. Um, but, you know, you get high notes by just tightening the face down here. Down here, never press, never do that. <laughs> The instrument is not resonating, it's my embouchure at the end of a pipe.
going, that's all. But they're a joke. But don't take them seriously. Don't go into corners and practice super top Ws because you've heard somebody else do it. Do it as a sort of, uh, you know, a bit of amusement for yourself and a once only on a concert amusement for the audience because they, it's a bit of circus, you know, it's the elephant standing on its head just for a second, but you know, if you... <laughs> <laughs> elephant standing on its head for two hours is, you know, you start... <laughs> you start looking for other things to do. Double stopping. Um, don't do this with composers and this thing, but you know, it, it is quite a laugh too. Um... <laughs> Again, you see, a lot of composers are asking for this sort of thing, and the tuba does lend itself rather well to it. Uh, so again, do that for amusement. For God's sake, don't uh, do it in an hotel room, or like that horn player that Weber wrote the concertino for, the landlord will charge you double. <laughs> there must be other joke things which must be always be treated as jokes. I mean, the, the bottom register, you know, you hear people... Um, well, you hear me, actually, sometimes. <laughs> Let that be a lesson to you. Always warm up in the morning. Um, but, you know, <laughs> ever, ever since things like the craft encounters with pedal, this, that, and the other, uh, you know, people are practicing down there. Well, it's fine, but it is only an effect. You know, a normal person can't tell you what that note is at all. They wouldn't have a clue. When I think of uh, the distinguished conductors who get the octave wrong that I'm playing in an orchestra, you know, how can you expect audiences to be totally tuned into what you're doing right down there? But it's nice to practice it, because um, not so much for musical effects, but other effects. Um, a lot of uh, contemporary music has kind of writing in it. And it's all part of the vocabulary nowadays, but again, don't take it seriously just just enjoy the feeling it's quite a nice feeling actually <laughs> well, no maybe it's not i don't know <laughs> <laughs> must be something that i haven't told you i'll remember it if we wind up now i'll remember it something out of the door um a question sorry jim i don't have no I, I didn't i didn't yes you did oh sorry I don't have a question, but before this thing is over, I thought I'd like to share one quick thing with you all. Uh, two or three years ago, the London Symphony was in Los Angeles for the first time that I had ever been there. I don't know if it was the first time he was there or not, but it was a wonderful concert. And after the concert, we were all, all kinds of musicians were in the uh, lounge that were downstairs. And I quite candidly overheard the first cellist of the London Symphony, who I forget his name, telling another cellist, the finest musician in the London Symphony is John Fletcher. Yeah. So I'll get him for that. I, I, I... <laughs> As a matter of fact, the reason I've got to leave this a day too early is because he's playing the Elgar Cello Concerto, and um, I've got to be there. Andre Previn's last concert with the London Symphony Orchestra. Altogether, ah, it's been 17 years, and very good too. Um, so that's why I'm leaving early, because I think it's very important to do so. But um, if there aren't any more questions, I'm going to be around. Yes, we have one, another one. Have you ever played, uh, have you been amplified when you when you're been playing. Oh, yeah, I, I use my kids' rock gear, flanges and octavers and all those things. You mean the mouthpiece? Uh, no, like through a microphone. You know, oh, well, yeah, of course I have, yeah. And how do you find uh, the amplification that, uh, methods that are used now? Well, they're mostly damnable. Um, most amplification is, most recording is, because uh, most recording engineers... Sorry, this is another hour-long thing, isn't it, Harvey? <laughs> <laughs> um, recording, you know, recordings are machines, and the machines are designed by people who have their own idea of what instruments sound like. Most people are reasonably clear what a trumpet and a trombone sound like, although mm. very often they sound a bit like that, but it doesn't matter very much. But most of the recordings that I play in, I've just got used to the fact that it sounds like this, because if you shove that sort of a sound into a big amplifier, they could control it easily. And uh, most of the recordings I've done are either like that or they're, um, you know, the hippo in a bathroom. 
where it really doesn't matter what you do. Um, it's one or the other. There are very, very few recordings that I've heard of my most esteemed colleagues, which I, where I think they've been done any justice by the recording, and it is difficult to do. I'm not altogether criticising the recording industry because um, they actually partly don't know. And once they've made their product, it then goes away to be pressed and mixed and all the other things by somebody in a lab who doesn't care tons what the tuber sounds like. Um, so we do suffer quite badly in this respect. And I don't know what the answer is, but to do all your recording yourself. I've got some mics at home which make me sound quite like I think me sounds like. <coughs> and there are times when I'm tempted to take them to recording sessions and just sort of stick them up under... <laughs> <laughs> then, of course, you know, you, you would be in trouble. But recording is a tricky <coughs> thing for YouTubers. Um, it grieves me that um, a lot of people know me through recording. And I can't... Uh, actually, most of the recordings, truthfully, I've not heard because I know I'm going to be sick when I do hear them, so I, I, I've avoided it. Yeah, records are what happens on a Thursday morning when you're either in good shape or bad shape. Um, as far as I'm concerned, concerts are the only thing that count. Real events with real people turning up to make you nervous, and when you're nervous, you know, then things might happen. You might collapse, you might make a terrible mess of it because you're nervous, but you might play better than you've ever played before. That's the one you're chasing. Records, that's not nerves, that's negative tension. <laughs> It's the end of that sermon, Harvey. It's quite short, actually. <laughs> Any more? No more? Yeah, yeah. I was just wondering, uh, how do you work with students on improving their information? I'll say, that's out of tune. <laughs> <laughs> Do you want a paragraph on this? Because, the, 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 again, one of the disadvantages of the tuba is upper instruments rely on you for good tuning. If a tuba is out of tune, especially in a brass group, it throws up foul, rancid harmonics which mess up everybody above. And the principal trumpet's there wondering why he can't get a third. And it's because that sod down the line is playing flat or sharp or out of tune. And uh, it's a very hard one. Um, a person who plays consistently out of tune has probably got a bad ear and probably won't... I, I'm a great fatalist. I think there are some people who can tell whether they're out of tune and others who probably never quite will. And you can just coax them one way or the other. You can say, on average, valve that down or lift that down. I use the mouth for tuning. I don't think there's any other way because, I mean, OK, on the big tuber, I'm, I'm doing this quite a bit up there, but on these, um, it's a waste of time. The mouth is more important. And there's no such thing as in tune anyway because... Some notes have got to be a bit up because that note on the horn is a bad one. The harmonics he's throwing out to the trumpets are not quite right. So you know that's got to be a bit up, that's got to be a bit down. You're robbing Peter to pay Paul all the way. There's no such thing as an in-tune tuba. And if you invent it, um, you're, you're stuck with having to then be in tune with everybody else with their in-tune trumpets. It's all glider pilot. It's like being put in a glider up there and you've got to get it down without bumping it. In the orchestra, do you pay close attention to the principal trumpet or...? It depends if he's there. <laughs> um, yeah, yes, of course I do. Yes. yes we've got to listen very carefully, but we've got a wonderful principal trumpet. The, the intonation is so secure, I never think about it at all. I'll just go boom and put it down. It's the same note that's been there for 16 years. A bit sharp. It's really I've stayed up too late. I've been you know, messing about. <laughs> Be practicing the carnival of Venice or something. <laughs> all these things do mess up too now. But do practice the Carnival of Venice. I, I, it's my ambition to play it one day. Did Mike do it last night? Yeah. 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 Um, it was one of my, the greatest memories of my life was hearing Mike do that at the Royal Albert Hall after the Brass Band Championships in the most hostile and chauvinistic atmosphere anybody can play. He got up and played that piece like I've never heard. It's fantastic, marvellous. And I was just, I was asleep. I was jet lagged last night, but I have heard it and it's marvellous. It's terrific. But don't spend all your time practicing it. For goodness sake, practice something else as well. Sorry. Now, I know it's getting near the end, but is there one um, memory that you've had in your career that you consider a really memorable musical experience that you've had that you stay with us? Yes, playing Brahms' Second Symphony with Carl Byrne at the Salzburg Festival. There aren't very many notes in the tuba part, but my goodness. Um, yes, that's it. <coughs> that's the one I take to my go. There are hundreds of others. And you never know when they're going to strike. That's the nice thing about music. It's not necessarily up on the high altar or the poshest place. We turned up to Columbus, Georgia, years ago with Yasha Horenstein, and we did Rosen Cavalier like I've never heard it since. And that's just one little thing. You don't know when St. Cecilia up there is going to suddenly single you out one night. 
you go patiently around hoping, you do your best, and every now and again it strikes, it's gold here, there, and it can be in the most unlikely places. When it's in the festival hall, of course, it's nice, because then the critics stop moaning. <laughs> Usually it's somewhere else. Yeah, Brahms too. About how many notes are there in that tuba part? Anybody counted them? Fifty. I'll have to them then. One question. When you play the E flat, two bar, and the Benjamin Brothers are playing something? Yes. Yes, pass it. Yes, uh, um, we're running over time, Harvey. Is that, is, that, is that a worry? Look, I play a C tuba most of the time in the symphony orchestra because it's weight of, rightly or wrongly, it's weight of sound and depth of sound that we're looking for because of the arms race. But there are a lot of things which are far better done on this. The string symphony is absolutely one of those, no question. You've got to have that uh, punch. It's an E-flat part. But you know, Britain and people like that have that sound in mind. Have a good Brian. Pardon? Havergal Bryan Gothic Symphony is it's in the Guinness Book of Records as the longest and the most expensive symphony ever written. The tuba part is 50-something pages. There, there are two tubas. He didn't play the instrument, he just loved it. Up and down the whole time. We could actually have a whole symposium one day, somebody just that one tuba part. Extraordinary. Rather good piece of rock. Something there wasn't. The arm trace, as you say, what pieces would you then do on? Sorry? What, what tuba, what pieces? Yeah, so if I wasn't an arm trace, what pieces would you still use on C-tuba? What pieces would I use to see tuba on? Well, don't forget, a lot of the orchestral repertoire, actually, it doesn't matter either way. And it sounds bone idle, but I very often use what's on the van, which happens to be the C-tuba. There's a lot of uh, orchestral tuba parts, it really doesn't matter. Um, but there are some where I would, be con I would consider myself professionally a bit negligent if I turned up and did, I'll say the Spring Symphony, um, since you mentioned it, but Berlioz Overtures, <coughs> I wouldn't want to do on the C tuber. It's not a question of the safety, it's, it's, the, it's, the, it's, the, it's, the, it's the rather over fatness, the port, it, it's, it's, it's the middle aged spread which the C tuber will give you. Uh, but if I turned up to do Prokofiev 5 on this, <coughs> Um, it would be remarkably efficient, and a lot of people wouldn't actually notice or complain, probably, but um, you just do need that extra snort and grunt. For coffee at Romeo and Juliet. Um, B-flat tuba, if it's a good B-flat tuba, then there are lots of things in the orchestral repertoire which actually are very good on the B-flat tuba, there's no doubt about it, but how many bloody tubas are you going to carry around? Um, that, that's the next question. I've got ten at home, and it's a fairly big house, but you know, I've got ten tubas, and I've got two kids and a mother's wife as well, and um, you've know, got to make room for them all. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'm supposing my one piece that I thought goes marvellously on the B-flat tuba, I'm supposing something else on the programme is very definitely better on something else, then, then forget it again. Um, but I've heard people play the B-flat tuba in the symphony orchestra very well. They're used to it. I think if you grew up on the B-flat tuba, why not stay with it? Because it's the same old thing. Practice the instrument that you know and play that better. That's sometimes preferable to messing about with other gear, but not always. You know, you fall into your own habits for your own reasons. Uh, your Philip John's brass work is done in E flat. Yeah. Clarity. Clarity. What did Chester say yesterday? Clarity. Our biggest problem, and it's got to be on a small instrument, if you're playing any kind of sentences, if you're speaking in any kind of way, playing lines, musical conversation, clarity. Remember always, if you think you're clear, non bass player people don't think so. You're, you're speaking about clarity, but there's really, uh, let's see. There's not been a lot of said about how to develop the specific techniques. I personally, I find the mouthpiece one comes from. How do you feel about that? Mouthpiece, yeah. I mean, I mouthpiece playing is also uh, very useful for traffic jams because we spend a lot of our time. The hardest thing about being a professional musician in London is getting to the assignments, getting to where you've got to be. It's damnable. Um, we don't have your through way. Uh, mouthpiece practice is quite useful. I learned to double tongue on the mouthpiece sitting in traffic lights. 
Um, it gets the chops going and you arrive, you know, exactly on the downbeat and the conductor goes like that and you can sit down and you can play the first note like that without embarrassment because you've got all that. Achieving clarity though, um, generally speaking, clarity can only be achieved with a reasonably tight face. Not with what I would call a trumpet on the necessarily, but if you've got large lips and you're well endowed and can make a nice fat sound just by going all, oh, then you're going to have more problems than somebody like me that's got a very average sized mouth. It works reasonably efficiently, but it's only very average in size. I didn't make a fat noise. Um, I heard clarity as a kid, therefore I subconsciously tried to imitate it. And if you've got a musical ear and you try to emulate something, very often you don't talk about muscles or how to do it. It sort of slowly comes by the process of imitation and uh, influence. Uh, but the face has got to be reasonably tight and the mouth not too wide open. Um, in other words, you, back to what I said earlier about uh, you know closing up a little bit if you've got to actually utter sentences. If you're playing nice big fat notes, then more open. Up. But it's much cheaper than buying 27 mouthpieces. You, know, you can get by on one. Nobody can find the, the perfect mouthpiece anyway, can they? Any, anybody found the perfect mouthpiece? Yeah, anybody? No, but you, you know, you find one that sort of does quite a lot of things reasonably well most of the time. The best offer I can